I have a, I have a riddle for you, and I'm glad that, the, that some of the kids left because they say that 80% of all kids get this riddle right away, but only 20% of adults get it. And the last time it was the Buller's young son that, that said it, but here it is, here's the riddle. What's greater than God, more evil than the devil, the poor have it, the rich don't need it, and if you eat it, you'll die. Okay. Okay, listen. So the riddle is, and you could have waited a minute, Brent, but that's okay. Okay, good. So what's greater than God, what's more evil than the devil, the poor have it and the rich don't need it, and if you eat it, you'll die. And the answer is nothing. There is nothing greater than God there is nothing more evil than the devil. The poor have nothing, and the rich need nothing, and if you eat nothing, you'll die. <laughs> right? It's so funny that sometimes when we hear that, it takes us a while to process, right? But the kids, man, they get it like, like, like Brent. He's a kid at heart because <laughs> he just got it right away. So, so another, another question I have before, before we get started is, and, and those of you that might know the answer, where's my wife? Wait before you answer. But what do you think is worse, worse than being lost? Being found? I don't know. Well, what's actually worse than that is knowing that you're lost and that nobody's coming to look for you, right? I think that's the world that we live in today. I think there's a world out there that has heard something about Jesus, but they don't know that it's true. They don't know that they can rely on it, and they know that they're lost, and in their in their understanding about being lost, they're thinking, is there anybody even coming to look for me? What a feeling, huh? I thought about that this morning as I was preparing for this message and I was thinking, wow, isn't, isn't that the mission of the church? You know, to let people know that you might be lost, but I'm looking for you that Jesus has sent me to find you. And it's really not me finding you, it's Jesus, amen? Man. You know, as Christians, we read scripture all the time, or at least most of us do. But we read scripture that indicate or reassure us that we can place our trust in God. And when we do, it tells us what will happen, right? It's funny, because I looked it up and over 351 times, it mentions something about trusting God. 351 times is a lot. It's a lot. They tell us in well-known scriptures, like in Proverbs chapter three, verses five and six, it says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all ways acknowledge him and he will direct your path. You see, that's the trust in the Lord and what will happen is he'll direct your path, amen? Even in our scripture of the year, Dave, it says in Romans 15, 13, it says, may the God of hope fill you with all peace and joy as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen? There again, we have the, if you trust in God, right, you will overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, amen? And even in Psalms 37, three and five, or three through five, it says, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land 
and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit yourself. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in him, and he will act. Amen? Aren't these powerful scriptures that tell us that as we place our trust in God, there's something that he does. There's something that he does on our behalf that allows us to grow even closer to him, amen? We know the Bible tells us that we can trust him, right? We we heard that 351 times. It tells us that we can trust God. But today I wonder how many times or how often do we ask ourselves, can God trust me. We find ourselves in situations all the time where we have to rely on God. We have to trust God. But how much do we actually think that God has to trust us as well? You see, every day we make decisions. And no matter how big or how small those decisions are, they become part of of who we are. Not only that, but after they become part of who we are, we become accountable to those decisions. Amen? Most people have a tendency to think that only the bigger decisions they make really matter, right? But that's not biblically true. Every little thing matters in the kingdom of God. And trust is built or lost one small decision at a time. Amen? Wow. Let's pray. God, we desire to be a trustworthy people. Help us to trust you as we follow you and grow in our ability to be faithful in the small things, faithful in the big things, and faithful in everything in between. We thank you, God, that you are a trustworthy God. Help us to be a trustworthy people. Amen. Amen. Well, our passage today has a lot to do with trust where it's placed, where it's misplaced, and where and what can happen when it's broken. Trust is one of the pillars of life that helps keep the world going round. You know, every day we trust that the sun will come up, right? We trust that there will be enough oxygen to breathe and enough water to eat and enough enough food to eat. We trust that people will obey traffic signs and signals when we drive around town, right? I mean, that's the biggest thing for me when I drive around town. I know that I'm a good driver, but I trust that everybody else is a good driver, especially in the weather that we've been having, right? You could say that you could say that trust is a currency that we are all familiar with even if it's not something that we think about very often. Are you with me today? So with that in mind, let me ask you, let me ask you guys a couple questions. Are you ready, Helen? She's like, "Yep, I'm ready." When was the last time you thought about trusting God? This morning, I like that. This morning, I had to trust him to get out of bed, right? Well, given, given the chaotic and fast-paced world that we live in, chances are pretty good that has been very recent, that we have to trust him on a daily basis. But here's the real question of the day. When was the last time that you thought if God could trust you? And then when was the last time you asked yourself, can God trust me? You see, this, this is a difficult question because most of us don't even trust ourselves. 
So how could God trust us when we don't even trust ourselves? It's a good question, right? But the funny thing is, is that for some reason, God's plan was and continues to be one where he uses fallible people like you and me to build the church and to share the gospel and be ambassadors of reconciliation to a lost and a hurting world. Amen? It's, it's crazy how he uses people to spread his word. And he uses fallible people. He uses people like me and you to go out and share that, that vision with people that even though they're lost, there's somebody looking for them. And as we're going to see today, he's got a few things to say why trust matters as much today as it did 2,000 years ago. Our main passage is a difficult passage, one that I had to study for a long period of time before I could present this message, and I hope and pray that I'll be able to articulate it well enough to where you understand the point. And I think in all the parables, this is probably one of the parables that Jesus spoke about that was the most difficult for him to, to speak. The passage comes from Luke chapter 16, verses 1 through 13. And it comes from the larger portion of scriptures where Jesus is doing a lot of teaching through stories called parables. Our particular parable today is often referred to as the parable of the shrewd manager. One of the first and primary lessons of the parable is that little things matter. Little things. Let's begin by reading Luke chapter 16, starting in verse 1. It should be up in the... Jesus told his disciples... There was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him and asked him, what is this I hear about you? Give an account for your management because you cannot be manager any longer. Wow. Just in these first two verses, it sounds like this this manager has, he's in some trouble, isn't he? Sounds like he's got some splaining to do, right? We know that this manager was accused of wasting his boss's possessions, but what do you think this manager was doing? Do you think it was something that just happened? Do you think it was a habit, a style, a a situation that kept occurring over and over and over and over, right? And how do you think the rich man was so fed up with him that he came to him at once and said, give an account for what you've done because you can no longer be manager. Those are some harsh words, right? Chances are it's pretty pretty good that, that it wasn't just one thing, but it was many little things that added up together And chances are that the rich man finally heard one too many bad stories about his manager and it pushed him over the edge. Does this sound familiar to anybody here today? If you're a parent, have you ever felt this way about your kids? How they just keep pushing and pushing and but mom, but mom, but mom, but mom, but dad, but dad. And they just keep pushing until you just finally say, stop it. Maybe you're a business owner or a manager yourself and you've had this experience and you understand how this this parable goes. Maybe, maybe even you're the one in trouble, like me. Have you ever pushed a parent or a boss over the edge? I know I have, several times. I still do it today. And when it happens, it's usually not just one thing, but many little things that get us to the end of our ropes, right? Little things 
that add it all together becomes big. And as much as these first couple of verses give us a context and characters for the parable, they also introduce the main point and the title of today's message, and that is, little things matter. Little things matter. And little things matter because they add up, they both, both positively and negatively, right? I mean, we don't have to talk about just, just negative. You know, sometimes there's this positive things that, that continue to add up. And before you know it, all you can do is thank that person or that situation that you're in for being so good. Amen? So I, I see that in my life with God, you know. Something will happen here and something will happen there and something will happen. Sometimes it's good and sometimes it's bad. But then at the end of it all, I could say, thank you, God, because now I see the plan and the purpose that you had. Let's continue as we read Luke 16, verses three through seven. It says this, the manager said to himself, what shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig. I'm, I'm ashamed to beg, and I know what I'll do so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me in their houses. So he called in each of his master's debtors, and he asked the first, how much do you owe my master? 900 gallons of olive oil, he replied, and the manager told him, take your bill, sit down quickly, and make it 450. Then he asked the second, how much do you owe my master? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. And he told him, take your bill and make it 800. We see in these verses upon quick review of his potential employment options that this manager makes a very hasty decision to do some creative accounting with his boss's debtors, right? He leverages his present network for his own future safety and security. So you see, his assumption is, this is what he's thinking, that if he cuts enough deals and extends enough favor, that he will have a backlog of, a backlog of favors that he can call upon when things for him gets rough. When his boss fires him, he can go to those people and claim that, hey, I did you a favor thing, right? The thing that's interesting is his cunning shrewdness and deceptive decision-making are probably the same thing that got him in trouble in the first place, right? But at this, play, at this point, He's got to learn, lean on his own abilities and figure out a way out of what's going to happen, right? He's going to lose his job, which we see amazingly he does. But what I find even more amazing is what happens next. Let me show you what I mean. Let's read 8 and 9, verses 8 and 9. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself so that when it's gone, you will be welcome into eternal dwellings. What? What a weird turn of events. The dishonest manager cuts potential profits away from his boss once again, but then he's praised for it. Well done. Now, if you're like me, you're thinking, maybe Jesus has gotten his parables mixed up on this one, right? I'm thinking something's not right. Maybe he's tired 
from all the teaching and all the traveling, that, and this parable doesn't just land the same way that all the other ones do. Like I'm thinking, did I read that wrong? Like why is Jesus telling his disciples a story about a person who was shrewd and then commending him for it? That's why I told you, as I, as I was led to preach on this topic, I was thinking, Lord, I, I, you gotta give me some understanding here because that doesn't make sense to me. So I began to contemplate and ask Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what's going on here? What's going on here? And you know what he said to me? It's weird. He said, Rick, maybe you're just missing the point and you need to look a little deeper onto this one. What? Maybe you need to dig a little deeper. Okay, so I began my study. And I started, I started lurk looking at different people's commentaries, different people's understandings. And, and I came upon this story. I want to share it with you this morning. There was a man who had taught school in New York City. The situation in the school was so bad that there were policemen stationed in the hallways. Teachers were routinely assaulted and intimidated. And this teacher quickly learned the realities of life in that school very quickly. On his first day of class, things seemed to start off really well. The students all sat relatively quietly in, the, in their seats, and some even gave attention to the teacher as he introduced himself. But at a predetermined time, the entire class got up out of their seats and went to the back of the classroom where they proceeded to shoot craps. The teacher didn't know how to respond, but he had noticed that the place that they were shooting craps, there was a metal plate. This plate that was on the ground seemed to be the perfect surface for them to play craps on. So the next day, the teacher came in prepared. He wired the plate with a nine volt shocking plate. And when the class went to the back to carry on their game, he charged the plate and things happened quickly, as you would expect. One extremely large fellow walked up to the teacher and said, nice touch, professor nice touch I think you can tell that on one hand the fellow did not appreciate getting zapped with electricity and yet on the other hand he had kind of an admiration for the way in which his teacher had handled things the teacher was shrewd in dealing with this difficulty the same can be said for the rich man in our text he didn't appreciate being ripped off by his manager, but he did at least have an appreciation for the shrewdness of the manager in making provisions for his future. The manager who was about to get fired had used his position and his manager's possessions in such a way to make friends and thus prepare for his future. Even the ma master had to agree that the manager was shrewd. Perhaps, in the words of the young thug, thug, the master could have said to the manager, nice touch, nice touch. So Holy Spirit told me not to get so dumbfounded on a portion of scripture because it seemingly contradicts the other popular teachings, but try to see why Jesus was telling this parable to his disciples. So listen to verse eight. The master commended the dishonest manager because he acted shrewdly. Now pay attention. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. Think about that for a second. Think about that. 
the people of this world are more shrewd dealing with their own kind than the people of the light. Do you know what the word shrewd means? What does it mean? Cheap? Selfish? Greedy? Dishonest? Huh? Sneaky! Right? And all of those are true. But when you research the word in the way that it was used in the Greek when this was written, it means to show quick, practical cleverness. Being shrewd is showing quick, practical cleverness. You see, the unjust steward is not just set before us as an example of cheating his master or to justify dishonesty, but to point out the careful ways of worldly men. And I think the point is, it would be well if the children of light, that's us, would learn wisdom from the men of the world in dealing with our own kind. Ooh, come on, come on. And if we became quick to show practical cleverness as we know the fulfillment of our salvation is approaching quickly. Are you with me? Anybody believe we're in the last days? How are we acting any different? Let me ask you this. If you knew that the world or that Jesus was going to come back tomorrow, would you change your life? Would you live your life any differently? Because if it was me, I would. And if you say you wouldn't, you're either a liar or a saint. (laughs) We need to begin to show quick, practical cleverness because we know that the fulfillment of our salvation is approaching quickly. You see, salvation is not just something that we receive when we first accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior. What? Salvation is something that we have to manage daily as we walk out our faith day by day until we receive the totality or the fulfillment of our salvation when we go home to be with the Lord. Amen? Are you with me today? We receive salvation We walk out salvation, but the completeness of our salvation does not happen until we go home to be with Jesus, okay? So the truth of the matter is, salvation is not totally ours until the day we are in his presence in eternity, right? The Bible says, I'm going to give you this, Pastor Wade, because you're probably going to ask me, where do you come up with that, Pastor Rick? And I'm going to tell you. Because in Psalms 3, 8, it says, salvation belongs to the Lord. If salvation belongs to the Lord, it's not mine. I might have a portion of it, but it's his salvation, amen? The manager own nothing of what he managed and neither do we and neither do we like him we are entrusted with the managers or with the master's goods and have been given a wide latitude to do with it as we wish are you with me today Dave wow we can develop what potential there is in our wealth and in our talents, in our resources, in our education, in our opportunities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, including money, or we can squander it. Amen? We can develop what salvation God has given us, or we can squander it. Wow. What, are you saying that you can lose your salvation, pastor? I'm not saying that. You said that. 
What I'm saying is that we can squander the salvation that belongs to God in the lives of other people if we don't do what we're supposed to do. However, no matter how free we may seem to be, there will come a day of reckoning. Our books will be audited. We will have to account for every minute that we have lived. I know some of you are out there thinking, the grace of God covers me prior to Christ. And it does. Thank God that I am not going to be accountable for those days I lived. Sarah, you know what I'm talking about. Those days that I lived before I knew who Christ was because the blood of Jesus covers me and he no longer sees me in the sin that I walked in, but he sees me in the blood of Jesus that I walk in, amen? So God is like the absentee landlord. He is still in charge and he gives us enough rope to either hang ourselves or use it as a lifeline to save others. Amen. Reuben, the decision is ours. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It also says in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, this then is how you ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries God has revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Amen? You know what that's saying? That saying is that, yes, that salvation is God's, right? And we have the opportunity to either use it or squander it. But let me tell you, if you squander it, you're going to be held accountable for it. That's what it's saying. You must prove to be faithful. What we have to understand is just that. It is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. The problem is we aren't by nature faithful. We're not faithful in our own. So when you think about it, when you think about being faithful, we think we need to be completely full of faith, which would be awesome, right? It would be great if we were all completely full of faith. But if you're like me, most of the time, I have to practice my faith little by little, one step at a time, right? One little thing at a time. And thank God I don't have to practice my faith with that huge, huge decision. Because I can do it one step, one day, one moment, one thing at a time. So that hopefully when that big decision is in front of me, I can do it. Amen? Chances are none of us will wake up one day being perfect. It's in all the little things that we do that cause us to be perfected day by day. Are you with me? We don't have to be perfect. We just have to be being perfected. The point is that it's in the little things that we do day by day for the kingdom that when they are all put together, they become really big. And you think about it, think, think about this this morning. If you look around the room, I'm gonna guesstimate that there's about 55 people in this room. And instead of Sarah doing one huge, momentous thing for the kingdom of God, if each and every one of us did just one little thing for the kingdom of God tomorrow, it would add up to be humongous, amen? It would be that big thing. In closing today, I 
I love saying that because I get some Snickers and Almond Joys. This parable reveals to us the power that little things have in our lives. Seemingly small decisions can have a huge impact. Small favors can reap huge rewards later in life. Small indiscretions can add up and get you fired. See, they work both ways. It all seems to to point back to that scripture. And from all of these little revelations, Jesus is able to pull it all together and give us a greater Revelation, what if there is a time when what we had done with what belongs to the master will be judged? And we will have to give an account for what we did with it or what we didn't do with it. And it didn't matter. Let me just say it this way. It doesn't matter. And it won't matter if you were too busy with work or you didn't have enough money or you didn't think you had enough time or you didn't know exactly how to do it or you didn't feel comfortable even if you didn't think it was going to make a difference. Because the truth of the matter is that little things matter. Jesus brings it all together with these few verses and he gives us an absolutely bedrock principle for life, which we probably all experienced at some point or another. And that's this. If you can't be trusted with the little that God has given you, you won't be ever trusted with anything more. Little things matter. Small decisions add up. This is such an important principle to learn early in life, and it's not just applicable to your life of faith, but all of life. Your job, your relationships, your your thought life, your financial management, your goals, your dreams, etc., etc. The list could go on forever and ever. In a best-selling book called Atomic Habits, James Clear says this. He says, all big things come from small beginnings. The seed of every habit is formed in the smallest of decisions. But when that small decision is repeated, it becomes a habit and it grows stronger and stronger. The question we have to ask ourselves today is what habit do we want in our lives? Trust begins like a small seed. It it grows just like a mustard seed. And when it gets a full maturity, you could set the birds in their branches. Your responsibility grows and others see that you're trustworthy. And all this brings us back to that awkward question that I asked at the beginning of our time together this morning. Can God trust you? Are you faithful in the little things of life? Or are you entertaining sin? I don't know about you, but I know that most of the times in my life, whenever I stopped or stepped into sin or found myself walking in sin, it all started with an idea. And I began to entertain that idea and think about it. And the next thing you know, it became a habit. Are you holding on to things that you don't want to give over to Jesus today? 
He's calling us to live lives of faithfulness, righteousness, devotion, starting with the small things that will eventually become the big things. With every head bowed this morning and no one looking around, I think we could all admit that there are areas in our lives that we still need to hand over to God. You may be sitting there this morning thinking, I'm not sure what that would be. But if you think about it for a minute, if I think about it for a minute, I can come up with a couple areas that I would like to just hand over to him. It doesn't have to be that huge thing. One little thing at a time. For whatever reason, we've been holding on to these things, trying to manage them, hoping that they will work out for themselves. But as Jesus so beautifully says it at the end of every, at the end of our passage for the day, you really cannot serve God and other things. Luke 16, 13 is the end of today's passage, which says this. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and mammon. Another way to say this is to say that we need to be willing to go all in for Jesus in our lives. We need to be adamant about the removal of sin from our lives. And we've got to stop entertaining those little discrepancies in our character, in our flesh. Again, it's the little things that matter. It's the little foxes that destroy the vineyard. We cannot be divided in our devotion. We cannot serve God and ourselves or God and money or God and our careers. He's calling us to live lives faithful and righteous, devoted to be the manager that he has entrusted us to be. So if that resonates with you today, I want you to invite yourselves to commit yourselves to the little things this week. Be intentional about your decision making. And if you have to make amends somewhere, then make amends. Seek and extend forgiveness where it's appropriate. And if you're here today, or you're online and you've never accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, and today you would like to, then I want you to come right up to the front right now because I want to pray with you. And I want you to know that even though you know you're lost, know this, someone is looking for you. If you're here today and you need someone to agree with you in prayer for whatever reason, whatever it is, then I want to agree with you in prayer. So if that's you, I want you to come up right up in front. Thank you. Anyone else? be with you in a minute. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your word. And we thank you for your message today. We admit to you that we need help in the little things that we do for your kingdom. Like the manager in the parable you spoke to your disciples about, we too 
want to be quick to show practical cleverness in sharing our salvation with others and so much more as we see the day approaching. Father, help us to understand that yes, those big things, they're important, but those little things that we do daily add up and have the biggest impact in our lives and the lives of people all around us. Father, we pray blessings. Lord, I, I pray blessings on each person here today and each of those who are watching online. I thank you, God, that as we depart from this place, we know that you will never depart from us, for your word says you will never leave us nor forsake us. We pray this in the precious and powerful name of your son, Yeshua. And we pray this. Amen. God love you. Thank you all for coming. I hope to see you next week. Invite a friend and have a great week.